thank you very much, and, and thanks to the organizing committee for the chance to come back and, and provide an update on, on the projects that North Arrow has active in Nunavut. Um, just a standard cautionary language to let you know that, that uh, at least some of what I'll say will turn out not to be true. <laughs> North Arrow is a, is a pretty standard junior exploration company. We're based in Vancouver. I'm not going to go through the, the corporate stuff. Um, if you want to learn more about the company, please feel free to track me down over the next couple of days and I'll, I'll take you through that. But we are, we are active and uh, we've been lucky. We've been able to remain pretty active through uh, the last few years, which has been a period of, of, uh, of relative inactivity and difficulty in raising the money to do the early stage exploration that's required to find the next, uh, the next mines in regards to the commodity. And we've been able to do that. Um, we have projects scattered throughout the country. We just finished a, a drilling program in Saskatchewan where we discovered a new field of diamond bearing kimberlites a few years ago and we, we continue to find more kimberlites there. Um, we just started a drilling program in the Lac Dra area, a redemption project, uh, and uh, that's more of a brownfields sort of exploration project. Uh, as, as we know, there's two of the, the largest diamond mines in the world are located in that region. But I'm gonna, I'm gonna focus today on our three projects in Nunavut. Primary project for us in the last few years has been Kilalugak, and I'll, I'll take us through that towards the end of the project. But first, I want to touch on, on the Lux and the Mel projects. Um, they're ones that we've been picking away at, and, and hopefully I can show you that, that we're getting closer to, uh, to discovering kimberlite on both of those. Kimberlite, of course, is the rock that we look for when we're looking for diamonds. In all of the diamond mines that are operating in Canada, uh, the diamonds are being mined from kimberlite bodies, so that is, that is our target. At Lux, where, where we are in the, in the Chesterfield Inlet, in the Rankin Inlet area, we're just north of the, uh, the Churchill Kimberlite Field. And these are kimberlites that were found a little over a decade ago. It was probably closing in on 100 kimberlite bodies were discovered by BHP at Shear Minerals and Sornoy, Sornoy Diamonds at that time. And uh, basically by cruising through and, and taking a look at the, uh, the assessment files, we identified uh, an indicator mineral train that did not have a discrete bedrock source. And so indicator minerals, another term that you hear at diamond explorationists talk about uh, often, and, and those minerals are minerals from within a kimberlite that have been eroded by glaciers and spread down ice as the glacier has moved over that kimberlite body. They indicate that they come from a kimberlite because they're, they're minerals of a specific composition and specific chemistry that tell us that the only way that they can end up in a glacial till deposit is if they've been eroded from a kimberlite and if actually that kimberlite has brought them from the Earth's mantle to the surface. Mm -hmm. It's the only way you can get minerals like this and they're a very positive indication that there should be, there should be a kimberlite source. And so this is the other way we often um, will will represent the data and these pies, the bigger the pie, the more of these indicators that have come from a from sort of a 20 kilo till sample is usually typically how, how how big those samples are, and you get these sort of linear arrays that are parallel to the ice direction, and that tells us if you work your way back up ice, you should be able to find a, a, a bedrock source for it. And ideally, that will be a, that will be a kimberlite. So we acquired three prospecting permits and three mineral claims to cover the area that we thought would have been the, the source rock or the source where the source would lie for these uh, for these samples. And I just wanted to also point out that uh, as we got further and further up ice towards these samples, we're getting more and more grains recorded by BHB. And some of these these pyro in this case, the counts are pretty high, which tells us we should be getting pretty close to uh, to a source. So eventually, we picked up the permits and the claims. Through some subsequent work in 2013 and 14, we've been, narrow, been able to narrow things down to the three mineral claims and we allowed the prospecting permits to lapse. Uh, and the work that we completed involved geophysics, did some airborne magnetic surveys, we identified a number of targets that we thought looked pretty good, we collected some more till samples, uh, immediately down ice and then also up ice uh, from, from those targets. And we've been able to confirm in our minds, at least, that uh, we are in fact getting very close to uh, to a bedrock source. In fact, if I get the, uh, the number up here, we have a couple of samples that sit in this area here where we're getting in excess of 200 pyrobes and thousands of elmanites. And we get grain counts like that, that's an indication to us, at least, that we should be very, very close to, uh, to the ultimate source. So the next stage at Lux is drill testing some of these ideas. Um, just last month, we got a permit to be able to go ahead and test uh, a number of these targets, um, a relatively low key sort of process, uh, doesn't warrant us putting in a camp. We'd like to do this work straight from the community of Chesterfield Inlet. And in, in an opportunistic way, when we, we hear about a drill going through, through Rankin Inlet, um, contract mm -hmm. to put out and just test these things and see if we can, we can find uh, the Kimberlite source. Um, so that's Lux. And Mel is, is in many ways a similar story. It's also pre-discovery. It's also a project that we acquired by trolling through the assessment filings of uh, earlier workers. In this case, it was worked by Stornoway Diamonds. They uh, were very active in the Melville Peninsula area 
in uh, the early 2000s. They discovered the Aviat kimberlite field, which is diamondiferous. At the same time, the HP was doing work down here, um, just outside of Nauyat, and discovered the Kilalugak project, which is now a North Arrow project, and I'll be talking about that. And then on the west side of the peninsula on Wales Island, the joint venture between North Arrow and Stornoway and BHP, we, uh, we discovered the Wales Island Kimberlites, which are very diamond bearing. It was one of these really efficient, almost too, from a junior's perspective, almost too efficient. In a period of about 18 months, we conceived the project. We did the work, we discovered the Kimberlites, we figured out there weren't any diamonds, and we moved on, which is, which is great. Uh, it was not necessarily great for building a story and anticipation, but it was, a, it was sort of a textbook exploration exercise. So we like this area. Mel um, is a similar story in that we looked at the work that, that Stornoway had filed and the assessment files in 2013 and, and 14. We collected a few till samples and we've essentially uh, defined two indicator trends in this area. Um, this shows our initial till sampling results and the work from Stornoway. In this case, the ice is moving down to the south, uh, to the southwest, um, and that's backwards. It was moving in the other direction. You know what that? But the ice is moving from, from here up that way, as you'll see. Relatively broad space sampling, and last year we went up and we collected another 220 till samples. And uh, the purpose of that was to try and better define these trains and see if it, we could start to resolve perhaps multiple sources. And just this morning we put out a news release. We haven't got all of the results back from the 2015 sampling, but uh, we have most of it. And uh, as you can see here, these again the pies. Remember the bigger the pie, the more indicators we're finding. The scale of these pies is identical to the earlier work, so we are seeing more and more grains. And in fact, we're getting, whereas we'd seen up to about 20 indicator minerals in some of the samples from the previous work, we're now getting samples with hundreds of indicators. So again, this is telling us that we're getting closer and closer to a bedrock <laughs> source that, uh, that would be in this area. A little bit more till sampling will be required here, but one of the things I'd like to key in on is, is not just that we're getting indicators, but we're getting a full suite of indicator minerals. And I'm not going to go into a full mineral chemistry background on this, but I, I like to show, show these plots because there's some pretty simple discriminating diagrams we can use when looking at the mineral chemistry from these, from these minerals to, to figure out if we're in the right, on the right track or not. Uh, Ilmenites is a, is a mineral that you hear about quite often, and in particular this diagram, it's a really straightforward diagram. We look at the titanium and the magnesium content of these, of these Ilmenites, and essentially if they fall to the right of this uh, sort of double line, that means they're derived from a kimberlite. If they, if they fall over here, then they're not from a kimberlite and they're not worth chasing up. It's an entirely an empirical observation, but it works on a global scale. You can take a kimberlite from anywhere in the world, get the ilmenites from it, plot them up, and this works. Uh, it's, pretty, it's pretty amazing. Similarly, then, when we look at the garnets that we, can, we recover from kimberlites, there's a couple of other empirical diagrams that are often used. When looking at pyro garnets, uh, these are the sort of purple, uh, red purple garnets that you see sometimes in, in, uh, in kimberlite talks. Um, and those of you that have followed diamond exploration at all will have heard about G9 and G10 garnets. Again, from an empirical observation, 85% of all pyro garnet inclusions in diamonds, these are garnets that have been found within diamonds, they plot to the right of this, to the left, left rather, of this line in the G10 field. It's an empirical observation, but it's one that works, and it's been proven by more scientific study over the last, uh, the last 30 years or so. And in general, if you have garnet, Pyro compositions that are that are straddling this line, that's a good thing. It means that those diamonds have come, or those those garnets have come from diamond stable mantle. And if there happens to be carbon in the mantle with uh, with these garnets, it should be in the form of diamond. And ideally, if the garnets were brought to the surface, the diamond should be brought to the surface as well. And that's that's the logic behind all this. Similar concept with eclogitic garnets. Eclogite is just another type of mantle rock. It's actually subducted oceanic uh, crust that's been taken down into the Earth's mantle. And this sort of squiggly line shows the compositions of, in this case, it's eclogitic garnet inclusions in diamonds, and they, they typically fall within this area, and the, the garnet compositions from Mel clearly fall in that, uh, in that area, and that's another positive thing. So we, uh, both Mel and Lux, were closing in on a discovery, and, and the next stage of those will be maybe a little bit more till sampling in the case of Mel, but then diamond drilling and trying to prove that, that, uh, that we've got kimberlite there. Um, Kimberlugak is our third project in Nunavut, and is a, it's at the other end of the spectrum. These kimberlites were found over 15 years ago by BHP. Subsequent work by Stornoway found some more kimberlites in this area. As I mentioned earlier, we're, we're right near the community of Nauyath, and, and the biggest kimberlite that's been discovered is called Q14, and it sits just seven kilometers from, from the community. We came on the scene in 2013. The Stornoway was focusing on, on building and developing the Renard Diamond Mine in Quebec. Uh, we stepped in. Uh, funded the collection of a bulk sample in 2014, uh, had that sample processed, got a, 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 recovered a parcel of diamonds and had those diamonds valued 
And with the uh, releasing, releasing that dime valuation, we then earned an 80% interest in the project. Um, last, uh, last year, I gave a presentation on the collection of the bulk sample, and I'm not going to go through it in a, in a ton of detail, but just to sort of remind ourselves of what, what happened. This green outline is, is the outline of the Q1 to 4 Kimberley. Lake. It's 12 hectares in size. It's big by Canadian standards. We collected our sample from these two red ovals, so the area of those two red ovals, uh, where the kimberlite is right at surface. It's obviously it's on land. It allowed us to sling out a little mini excavator. We put the excavator back together, we filled 1,650 mega bags with the kimberlite that we scraped from the surface. We slung the bags to uh, to a lay down area uh, in the in the community. Uh, mentioned the two pits, so here you can see we're right near the end of the sampling. There's some bags sitting in the central pit where we collected. Uh, about two thirds of the sample, another third came from the west pit here, and there was a little hand dug pit of Stornoways where they collected a, a sample by, by hand in 2007. When we were done, we, um, we reclaimed the pits, um, filled them back in here at the west pit when we were just about done in, in the early part of August, and then a few weeks later after we backfilled in it and moved on. As mentioned, the bags were sent to a lay down area at Naliath. They were then loaded onto a Degagne sea lift, shipped to Montreal, sent to a lab, and processed. And, uh, and the diamonds were, were recovered. And that's essentially where we sat this time last year when I gave this presentation. We had some of the diamonds uh, had been recovered and have, we had some photographs of them. Um, the key thing I want you to focus in on are, are these two guys here, are these, these orangey yellow diamonds, because they're an important part of, of the story right now going forward. Um, but we were waiting to get the last of the diamonds recovered and get the valuation completed. We were able to do that. We did that uh, through the next couple of months, and, and uh, through May, we took the diamond parcel. It was 384 carats that we recovered. We shipped it to Antwerp for a third-party valuation, and those valuators came up with basically two conclusions. The first was that the parcel was too small to make any conclusions on, on the ultimate value of the diamonds. Um, with our deal with Stornoway, though, we needed a valuation, and we needed to make that public in order to vest our interest. So we ended up with a model price range um, of between $43 a carat and $92 a carat. Um, we released that information on June 9th, and, uh, and the market didn't like it too much. This was our, our stock price uh, uh, on, on that day. Um, obviously, it was, a, it was a negative response. People didn't think too much of that number. They kind of skipped over the first conclusion and went straight to the numbers, which, which in many ways makes sense. Um, and this happens, it happens in exploration. We, we identify ideas that we think, and, and areas that we think of perspective. We need to figure out what is the next question that needs to get answered, and if it's a positive answer, then we can move on with evaluation, and if it's negative, well maybe we need to move on to something else. So we uh, are clearly faced with a, a question now of whether it makes sense to, to keep going with this project or not. So we've had a few months now to try and, and review this and, and take a look at it, and I think a good starting point for us is taking a look at this slide, which is one that I was using when, when talking to investors about, about the project and why we liked it. it. And it really does tick off a lot of the boxes. When you look on a global scale for where can we find the next diamond deposit, it hits a lot of the right marks. It's in a jurisdiction, as we all know, in this room with a set of land claim. That's hugely important. There's an open, transparent permitting process. And Eagle Eagle has successfully uh, permitted two diamond, or sorry, two gold mines at, at Metal Bank and Meliodine. Uh, you can develop and permit a mine in the other It's very important that, that you're able to do that and you're able to show your investors that it's possible to do that. The project is located on Tidewater. As I mentioned, we're only seven kilometers from the community here. When we, uh, when we were able to, uh, to collect the bulk sample in 2014, um, the vast majority, uh, over about two thirds of our, our employees were from the community of Nalia. We had an evening shift of work that other than the helicopter pilot who was flying, all of the employees working in the evenings were were uh, residents of Nalia. There were no Southern employees, no North Arrow employees, full-time employees on that shift. All of those employees were able to, to work on the project and sleep in their own bed at night. It's a really unique situation in Nunavut, and, and it's very important. Being on Tidewater, when we look at successful mining developments in the Canadian High Arctic, a lot of those deposits sit on Tidewater. It really drastically reduces your costs. Um, we think that the cost structure here would be, would be far lower than at Lac de Gras, uh, so it's another very important thing. The deposit itself is big. As I mentioned, Q14 is a big kimberlite. There's lots of tonnage. We've only, uh, the inferred resource only goes down to 200 meters, and the kimberlite itself is still over seven hectares in size and plan area at that, at that depth. There's a lot more kimberlite there, and there's another 15 kimberlites to be evaluated in this area. So there's a lot going for it in terms of, of blue sky, but obviously we've been tripped up on this diamond valuation. Are the diamonds valuable enough to move forward with? And we do know that, uh, that we were challenged with a very small diamond parcel. At only 300 carats. The whole point of this was to get an indication of value. It was not to get a definitive value in the first place. Um, but
but we were also uh, challenged by the fact that we were lacking higher value bigger stones and the other challenge for the whole thing is a, a lot of the diamonds have these cubic shapes and that's an issue when it comes to yield and by yield I mean is when you have a rough diamond and you polish it into a gem to be set into a piece of jewelry how much diamond is left over how much of that original carat weight is left over in the finished gem uh, obviously the, the higher the yield the more diamond that's left over then the more valuable the diamond would be and, and with cubic shapes your yield just is not is not as high when we look at some of the other questions other than value that we wanted to answer with the bulk sample the answers were all positive but we were looking to see going into that project if we were even going to have diamonds that were greater than a carat in size and, and yes we do have diamonds that are greater than a carat in size and and we also wondered about the fact that we could see these yellow diamonds in the initial work that bhp had done but were they a model a population that's distinct that could be modeled as a separate and unique uh, and unique population and would we, would we be able to project how uh, how frequently we might be able to recover those diamonds and yes we can do that these are clearly part of the population and in fact not only are the larger are larger diamonds there but the three largest stones that we recovered which were all greater than three and a half carats they were all yellow and this is a photo this is an important photo actually because it shows what we call the run of mine these are all of the diamonds greater than 9 dtc that we recovered from the parcel so those would all be greater than about 0.13 of a carat in size and there's a lot of yellow and orangey yellow scattered throughout here when we get into these larger sizes I mean, we said the overall carat weight of the yellow diamonds was about 20 percent it's actually greater than that when we go into the larger sizes when we had the valuation done in antwerp we got no no premium price for the presence of those yellow diamonds and there's a number of very good questions and, and reasons for that and and so we, the next question for us to ask is, okay, at the end of the day, the whole point of this, the whole point of finding any diamond deposit is, can we produce beautiful gem diamonds that can be put into jewelry that people will covet and want to pay a lot of money for? And that's, that's ultimately what we're, we're, we're appealing to people's vanity here. So we said, well, let's, let's answer that question. Let's take some of these diamonds and polish them. There were concerns with the ability of some of these diamonds to, to, to be able to polish them. So we, we've gone ahead and done that. This is a, one of the diamonds from that earlier photo that I showed you. We've had it cut into a, a round, brilliant diamond the certifier does not seem this color from any Canadian production. It's known to come from Russia a little bit. Also been known to come from uh, some areas of, of Africa, West Africa. But it, it's a rare color, and it's it is worth the premium price compared to what these diamonds are valued in, in the uh, in, in the rough diamond parcel itself. So we've been able to answer the question that yes, these things can be polished. Yes, they they uh, they are truly fancy colored colored diamonds. One of the comments we had is that you can't call a rough diamond fancy color because that's a term only applied to polished diamonds. Well now we can do it. But it leads to a bunch of other questions for us. And we're carrying on with this polishing exercise. We're taking that largest diamond that we recovered, which is 4.4 carats, and we're getting it polished right now. So if we can show those big diamonds carry on and, and have uh, a part of this color profile, that'll be hugely important for this project. Um, ultimately, what we need to do is convince ourselves that by collecting a bigger sample, we'll be able to collect bigger diamonds that um, would lead to polished, fancy, orange, orangey yellow diamonds in this size range. And if we can do that, then we think we can show the, the evaluation and see this project uh, move forward. But I'm getting, I'm getting way back here, so I've run out of time. But uh, just stay tuned. Stay tuned on this one. I agree. As I said, we're trying to build a case for ourselves. And if we can convince ourselves more work is required, then we can talk to investors and, and, and local communities that uh, more work is, is, is definitely warranted. And I think we're heading that way. Thanks very much.